It will not be easy to endure their stupidity, but I have confidence that we shall prevail. I'm not prepared for that. Hello lovely people, my name is Emma. Welcome back to my channel, welcome if you are new. One of my share buttons is undone. Today you will be thrilled to hear that you don't have to put up with me for very long. My life is insane right now. <laughs> it's very busy, I've got a lot of fingers in a lot of pies and so forth. I'm running hither and thither doing things and stuff on other places. Anyway, basically I'm busy as hell, but doing cool things that will come out here soon. And fear not, I will not abandon you in the void. I am leaving a very delicious treat for you. Delicious. <laughs> I could have chosen any other word. This week I have a guest in the form of my friend. I am of course talking about Willow the Wendigo, a fellow nemesis of Matt Powell, which is a testament to anybody's character. You've probably heard me mention her on the channel before. You might even have seen us very badly playing some horror games together on Twitch. Now what, we're, uh, what you're seeing is that all of these spiders are the same kind. Oh, okay. Spider kind? Okay. Oh, I think shit. we died. <laughs> <laughs> This video is awesome. It's going to be super interesting, it's really informative, and it's very funny. Willow is going to give us a lot of very useful tools for combating bad faith arguments, especially in the context of religion. I love it, I think you will too. So, it is time to learn what makes a sound argument, to understand some logical fallacies, and to begin our fight against the Knights of the Dunce Table, most of whom I think you'll recognise. There's an accompanying video out right now on Willow's channel about Matt Pal specifically. Go there, bookmark it as soon as you finish this video. Go and check that out. Leave lots of love in the comments for Willow. She's not only a friend and helping me out, but her videos are genuinely so informative in such a fun way. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you in the Deadwood. Welcome to the Deadwood. I'm Willow the Wendigo. I make my home here. First, a big thank you to Emma as an order for letting me guest host a video on her channel. I'm excited to share some insight with all of you. Today, we're going to take a look at logical fallacies and some people who are really bad at making arguments. This should be a funny and interesting journey. Hopefully, you'll also learn a little something. If you like what you see, you can visit my channel afterward for a follow-up to this video all about Matt Powell's use of fallacies. So don't be shy, grab a beverage or a bite to eat, and let's have a chat. The knights of the dunce table are paragons of logical fallacies and poor argumentation. However, it will be difficult to examine their inanity effectively without first having a basic understanding of what logic is. So let's discuss logic at a beginner's level. Then we'll do an overview of a few of the village idiots. That sounds good. Logic has been defined as the science of reasoning, in that it distinguishes correct reasoning from incorrect reasoning. The basis of logic is arguments, which are made of declarative sentences called statements. One statement is the conclusion of the argument, while the rest are premises that support it. Take a look at this example. To the right of the vertical yellow line is an argument. The sentences in blue are the argument's two premises. Together, they support the argument's conclusion, the sentence in red. Three important concepts in logic are factual correctness, validity, and soundness. Basically, only sound arguments should convince us of their conclusions, so determining their soundness is important. Let's examine each of these concepts. Premises are capable of being either true or false, and this is important in determining whether or not the argument is factually correct. Take a look at this argument. Premise 1. Kent Hovind lives in Alabama. Premise 2. Kent Hovind served time in prison. 
Conclusion, Kent Hovind is a body snatcher. This argument is factually correct. That is, its premises are all true. However, its conclusion does not follow from its premises. Factually correct arguments may have false conclusions, though this is not always the case. This is because an argument's correctness only refers to its premises. The validity of an argument refers to whether its conclusion follows from its premises. That is, if all of the premises of a valid argument are true, the conclusion would also be true. Here's an example of a valid argument. Premise 1. Kent Hovind genetically alters other creatures to look like himself, then transfers his consciousness into these creatures. Premise 2. Body snatchers genetically alter creatures to look like themselves, then transfer their consciousness into these creatures. Conclusion. Kent Hovind is a body snatcher. This argument is valid. That is, if the premises are true, the conclusion follows. However, the premises are not true. Or are they? It may be true. I wouldn't be dogmatic on it. So while the argument is valid, it is not factually correct. You may have noticed that not all arguments are factually correct, and not all arguments are valid, but some may be both. Arguments that are both correct and valid are sound arguments. These are arguments that are worth paying the most attention to, and that should have the most persuasive power over us. Here's an example of a sound argument. Premise 1. Willow the Wendigo lives in the Deadwood. Premise 2. The Deadwood is located in Hell. Conclusion. Willow the Wendigo lives in Hell. This argument is both factually correct, its premises are true, and valid. Its conclusion is necessarily true if the premises are true. So, it is a sound argument. Just because an argument seems sound doesn't mean it is. After all, we are all fallible human beings who make mistakes. This includes when we are analyzing arguments for weaknesses. But by critiquing arguments with a set of tools and applying critical thinking, we can reduce the number of unsound arguments we fall for. You will encounter a lot of bad arguments while you are trying to find sound ones. For this reason, I shall now equip you with a patented shit tech, ignorance, dumbassery, inanity, obtuseness, and total waste of time, resistor belt. It contains three tools which will help you weed out bad arguments. These tools are the burden of proof, falsifiability, and Occam's razor. The first tool on your belt is the burden of proof. This is an incredibly important concept in logic. While some philosophers still debate where the burden of proof falls, in both law and philosophy, it generally falls on the person making the claim. The Oxford Dictionary of Philosophy puts it this way, quote, If in some situation there is a proper presumption that something is true, anyone seeking to prove its opposite is said to bear the burden of proof. A certain amount of philosophical jockeying consists in trying to shift the burden of proof. End quote. Put more simply, the burden of proof means when someone makes a claim, that claim needs to be substantiated by the person making it rather than disproved by someone challenging it. So, the onus of proving an assertion relies on the person making that assertion. I'm not prepared for that. Ridiculous. We are bewitched. For instance, if I were to proclaim that Winston Churchill were the greatest political figure to ever live, the burden of proof would be on me to prove that claim. I would need to provide evidence that Mr. Churchill's deeds outweighed those done by everyone else. It would not be logically sound for me to make such an assertion and stand by it until someone else proved that Churchill was not the greatest political figure to ever live. In 1952, 
Philosopher Bertrand Russell created an excellent example of the burden of proof that was deliberately designed with religion in mind. It is called Russell's Teapot. Many Orthodox people speak as though it were the business of skeptics to disprove received dogmas, rather than of dogmatists to prove them. This is, of course, a mistake. If I were to suggest that between the Earth and Mars there is a China teapot revolving about the Sun in an elliptical orbit, nobody would be able to disprove my assertion, provided I were careful to add that the teapot is too small to be revealed even by our most powerful telescopes. But if I were to go on to say that, since my assertion cannot be disproved, it is intolerable presumption on the part of human reason to doubt it, I should rightly be thought to be talking nonsense. If, however, the existence of such a teapot were affirmed in ancient books, taught as the sacred truth every Sunday, and instilled into the minds of children at school, hesitation to believe in its existence would become a mark of eccentricity, and entitle the doubter to the attentions of the psychiatrist in an enlightened age, or of the inquisitor in an earlier time. The understanding and application of the burden of proof is foundational to the use of logic. The second tool on your belt is the concept of falsifiability. This means that a claim can be proven wrong. If a claim cannot be proven wrong, it may as well be useless. Take, for instance, one famous example of the need for falsifiability from astronomer and science communicator Carl Sagan. He wrote about a thought experiment similar to Russell's teapot. In Sagan's thought experiment, however, he asserts there is a real living dragon in his garage. Show me, you say. I lead you to my garage. You look inside and see a ladder, empty paint cans, an old tricycle but no dragon. Where's the dragon, you ask? Oh, she's right here, I reply, waving vaguely. I neglected to mention that she's an invisible dragon. You propose spreading flour on the floor of the garage to capture the dragon's footprints. Good idea, I say, but this dragon floats in the air. Then you'll use an infrared sensor to detect the invisible fire. Good idea, but the invisible fire is also heatless. You'll spray paint the dragon and make her visible. Good idea, but she's an incorporeal dragon, and the paint won't stick. And so on. I counter every physical test you propose with a special explanation of why it won't work. Note that this invisible dragon seems suspiciously similar to common claims of deities. God, it seems, cannot be seen, heard, tested for, measured, or felt except by those who already hear its voice or feel its presence. Attempting to prove such a being's realness is met with excuse after excuse for why doing so is impossible. God retreats ever farther into untestable nothingness while simultaneously becoming an all-engrossing mental slave master. Sagan continues by pointing out that such a being as his dragon, which cannot be proven either to exist or to not exist, may as well be non-existent. Now, what's the difference between an invisible, incorporeal, floating dragon who spits heatless fire and no dragon at all? It's worth noting that lack of evidence does not mean something doesn't exist. There is always the chance that a deity of some type might exist, and that it's hiding its presence, or choosing to remain mysterious. Sagan himself acknowledges this, and points out that to be open-minded, you should not outright reject the possibility that a dragon exists in his garage. Occam's Razor is a philosophical principle popularized by Franciscan friar William of Occam, who lived during the 1300s. It states, Entities should not be multiplied unnecessarily. The idea is that when two competing hypotheses make the same predictions, the simpler one should be preferred over the more complicated one. This can be a powerful tool when cutting through unnecessary drivel. Take, for example, the following two hypotheses. 
We already know what can cause PTSD, but for the sake of learning, let's pretend we don't. How do we explain why I have post-traumatic stress disorder? My doctor's hypothesis. I experienced a prolonged, multi-year period of stress. I was then subjected to a severely upsetting situation I could not escape that scared me so badly my brain has not recovered even multiple years later. Accessing memories of the event, visiting locations similar to where it took place, and pseudo-random signals in my brain may cause me to have panic attack-like outbursts of extreme terror. An alternate hypothesis. The horse god Alaberath has selected me to raise his mortal form on a farm in Montana, but I have not heeded his call. An ethereal, microscopic seahorse has infiltrated my skull after being summoned by worshippers of Alaberath via a ritual. It sits in my cerebellum, enticing me to do Alaberath's will by causing me discomfort and making me feel terror while I do anything except raise horses on the aforementioned farm. The writhing and screaming I perform while under the throes of my agony are the closest my body can get to communing with the great horse god. Nay, nay. <laughs> Both of these hypotheses explain the same phenomena. However, my ridiculous horse-centric model has far more assumptions than the standard scientific one. According to Occam's razor, it is thus much more reasonable and logically justified to assume the simpler explanation. Note, however, that Occam's razor does not apply to hypotheses explaining different phenomena. This is an especially important point to consider. It also applies only to hypotheses, not to tested events. We know how some things work. In those cases, simply saying God did it is not the correct explanation, even if it is more simple, because we've already used the scientific method to figure out how reality works in that area. As one of my sources put it, while using the word theory as a substitute for a hypothesis, Occam's razor is often cited in stronger forms than Occam intended, as in the following statements. If you have two theories that both explain the observed facts, then you should use the simplest until more evidence comes along. The simplest explanation for some phenomenon is more likely to be accurate than more complicated explanations. If you have two equally likely solutions to a problem, choose the simplest. The explanation requiring the fewest assumptions is most likely to be correct. Or, in the only form that takes its own advice, Keep things simple. Notice how the principle has strengthened in these forms, which should be more correctly called the law of parsimony or the rule of simplicity. To begin with, we used Occam's razor to separate theories that would predict the same result for all experiments. Now we are trying to choose between theories to make different predictions. This is not what Occam intended. Should we not test those predictions instead? Obviously, we should eventually, but suppose we are at an early stage and are not yet ready to do the experiments. We are just looking for guidance in developing a theory. Now that you are reasonably equipped, I will lead you into battle against the Knights of the Dunce Table. Here are a few of their more well-known members. It will not be easy to endure their stupidity, but I have confidence that we shall prevail. To increase our chances of surviving, let us engage only two from the top row today, and take on our adversaries one at a time. Lord Hovendom is also known as Kent Hovind. His status as Master of the Dunce Knights is also currently in question, as he has been convicted of both tax fraud and domestic abuse. Given the verbal abuse and disrespect he has shown to Miss Thorne, whom I consider a friend, I shall refer to Hovendem by his prisoner number, 0645-2017. 0645-2017 regularly belittles and abuses the people he engages with, he calls them morons, stupid, 
threatens them with eternal judgment from his imaginary friend, and even deliberately uses an incorrect name when referring to them sometimes. These actions are sometimes identified as an ad hominem fallacy, but this is not necessarily the case. Let me show you why. What is an ad hominem fallacy? It is an irrelevant attack against a person or their character, rather than their argument. Examples are, You can't trust anything Willow says because she's friends with Satan. Anyone who believes abortion is okay is evil and not worth listening to. A very common example of this is to make fun of someone's appearance or name. Note, however, that making fun of someone isn't necessarily an ad hominem fallacy, because it isn't always done to undermine an argument. There is some gray area here, and we need to be careful to not go around screaming, THAT'S A FALLACY! AND THAT'S A FALLACY! Verbally abusing someone could be a fallacy, if you're attempting to undermine their argument by attacking their irrelevant traits. It could also be a fallacy if you're trying to make the person seem untrustworthy, say by pointing out that they're wearing satanic jewelry. In that case, it would be the fallacy of poisoning the well, which is a type of ad hominem attack. If you're doing things like this... So tonight, we have Creepy Blinder, from England, I believe. Then it's probably an example of poisoning the well, which is an ad hominem fallacy. Either that, or you're just being an asshole. To avoid the ad hominem fallacy, we must be careful of the criticisms we make. Anytime we make criticisms of people, rather than their arguments, we must ensure that such criticisms are relevant to the argument at hand. Inmate 0645 2017 might take any criticism of his past as an ad hominem fallacy, but this is not always the case. As said before, he is a convicted fraudster and domestic abuser, as well as a prolific liar who is known to repeat the same lies even when shown to be wrong in discussions. These facts do not mean everything he says is invalid by definition, but they do become relevant when discussing his credibility in many areas. His trustworthiness, in particular, has been almost irrevocably tarnished by the planning required for his tax violations, his refusal to admit wrongdoing in that case, and his ongoing misrepresentation of debate opponents despite their corrections of him. There are cases where attacks on a person's character are relevant. For example, a person's hypocritical sexual behavior would be relevant to bring up if they were trying to become a church's pastor. However, attacking the sexual proclivities of an opponent in a debate on the efficacy of green energy would be an ad hominem attack. As the master of circles, John MacArthur is unparalleled in his use of the logical fallacy of circular reasoning. He is able to bend an argument on itself until it becomes an infinite loop of bullshit, nearly insurmountable in its fallaciousness unless you have an idiot resistor belt. Thankfully, I have provided you with one. So let's deconstruct what he says. In a world where everything is true and acceptable, how do you prove that the Bible is really true? So there are lots of lines of evidence which you would use to prove the veracity of Scripture. Come on, don't bullshit me. One of them would be the person of Jesus Christ. The presentation of Christ in the Bible is beyond human invention. No! You remember that they said of Jesus, no man ever spoke like this man spoke. Mm -hmm. His words are just beyond all human philosophy. It couldn't have made him up. How do you explain his resurrection with 500 eye Are you sure about that? ...who didn't expect him to rise from the dead? The only explanation is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The birth of the church comes out of that. After this, MacArthur talks about supposed prophecies and science in the Bible, both of which have already been ripped apart by other videos I'll link below, including one of my own about the Bible's irredeemably wrong creation account. Let's just deal with what's on screen here. 
First, note that the very question posed is a hypothetical. We do not live in a world where everything is true and acceptable. We have hundreds of laws, and the idea that a global flood happened is demonstrably untrue, for example. MacArthur begins his argument by claiming that Christ in the Bible is beyond human invention. But he was asked how to prove the Bible is true, and his supposed proof comes from... the Bible. What is this magic? What is this new devilry? It's called the fallacy of circular reasoning. The fallacy of circular reasoning is a logical fallacy wherein the arguer assumes their conclusion within the premises of their own argument. In other words, quote, the reasoner begins with what he or she is trying to end up with, end quote. Defenses of the Bible's supposed divine inspiration commonly use this fallacy. That's what MacArthur does repeatedly throughout this video. He is supposed to be making an argument, consisting of premises and a conclusion, that convinces us the Bible is true and other sacred texts are not. Yet his premises consistently assume his conclusion that the Bible is an authoritative true text. You remember that they said of Jesus, no man ever spoke like this man spoke. They couldn't have made him up. How do you explain his resurrection with 500 eyewitnesses who didn't expect him to rise from the dead? How do you expect apostles who thought he was dead and were running to hide, all of a sudden becoming world-changing zealot evangelists? Well, that, or else his premises are simply false, like these. His words are just beyond all human philosophy. The only explanation is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. A similar informal example of circular reasoning looks like this. The Bible says being gay is a sin. Why should I care what the Bible has to say? It's God's word. It's inspired by him. The guidebook for our life. How do you know the Bible is the word of God? It was written by his apostles, people inspired by the Holy Spirit. How do you know that? Well, in 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul writes that all scripture is breathed out by God. So you know the Bible is God's word because it says so? To avoid circular reasoning, we must ensure we do not rely on our conclusion within the premises of our argument. This is why when people bring up any Bible verse as proof of the Bible's supposed inerrancy or divine inspiration, I get very annoyed. Well, that and the fact that the Bible is demonstrably self-contradictory and incompatible with reality. I want to close out this video by applying what we've learned to an excerpt from a book by Frank Turek and Norman Geisler. It's called, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. And it's absolutely asinine. This 450-page napkin is so horribly inane, it serves as little more than an extended clinic on how to employ fallacious and dishonest arguments. Let's vitiate two small bits of chapter 4. Remember that we have three primary tools with which to weed out bad arguments. The burden of proof, falsifiability, and Occam's razor. In chapter 4, the authors of I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist present the teleological argument. This is their verbatim presentation of it. 1. Every design had a designer. 2. The universe has highly complex design. 3. Therefore, the universe had a designer. <laughs> Let's apply our tools to it. Remember that for an argument to be valid, its conclusion must follow from its premises. The authors say this argument has been confirmed to be valid. Indeed it is. If every design has a designer, and the universe is designed, then it must have a designer. However, is the argument factually correct? An argument must be both correct and valid to be sound, and it is sound arguments that have the most persuasive power. 
This argument is not correct. It is therefore not sound either. God fucking damn it! But why? First, we recognize where the burden of proof lies. The authors are making an assertion that their god exists. Thus, it is their job to convince us that their god exists. We have no burden to disprove its existence. Next, we see if this argument is falsifiable. Can this argument be proven wrong? This is where we run into issues. Can we tell the difference between something that is designed and something that is not designed? I would think so, but that would depend on the definition of designed. Does it mean complex? Does it mean geometrically complicated? Or perhaps made with artificial parts? There are natural formations that suit the first two definitions. Molecules and the interplay of their parts and the forces that hold them together are complex. Snowflakes form naturally and are incredibly beautiful and complicated. Both are formed with no designer. Anything artificial, meanwhile, such as the wristwatch the authors mention in their watchmaker analogy on this same page, clearly requires a designer to exist, but by definition, there is no such analog in the natural world. Thus, the very first premise is flawed. Until there is a definitive way to prove the universe is designed, this premise is merely an assumption, an opinion, rather than a demonstrable fact. Until then, we can't tell the difference between a magically conjured universe and one that came about by natural processes we can understand. Which takes us to the third tool in our belt, Occam's razor. We can apply this to the entire argument and slice it apart. What we have here are an abundance of unnecessary assumptions when we already have other explanations with the same explanatory power. The authors are arguing for a creative being who magically spoke the universe into existence. This being is responsible for all laws of physics, matter, energy, etc. The creation of these and other basal traits of reality requires the being to be a bodiless mind outside of time and space. It also has to be able to interact with the universe in a physical way without being physical, create the fundamental forces, and create energy. Apparently, it also existed when there was nothing else, while we have yet to even find out if a nothing is possible. None of these traits seems to be possible to have. Having them is nonsensical, similar to asking what happened before the Big Bang, when time apparently began. They are, of course, possible, as by no means do we fully understand everything about our reality, especially in terms of its origins. But we have simpler explanations for what we can observe, and these explanations have the same explanatory power. Perhaps the universe produced itself from natural processes. Perhaps other universes like our own collided to make ours, or our universe is in a cycle of collapsing and expanding forever. The worry of infinite regress, for example, what formed the other universes and what formed the thing that formed them, also applies to a god. Claiming a god solves that problem is the fallacy of special pleading, which is for another time. Suffice it to say, taking god as an explanation for things we don't understand is an unnecessary assumption. God is supernatural by definition, and the supernatural requires assumptions unnecessarily multiplied entities, as Occam might have put it, that aren't needed by natural explanations with the same explanatory power. Lastly, note that even if we grant this argument in its entirety, it only gets us to a creative force behind the universe. It does not give us a specific god, and definitely not the god of the Bible. So while the authors use it as proof of their specific god, the leap they make from a creative force to my specific zombie savior that died for your sins is simply indefensible. Finally, let's dissect this short passage from I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. In it, I can identify a myriad of logical fallacies and dishonest argumentation. I haven't gone over some of these fallacies in detail yet, so I'll quickly summarize them as we meet them and detail them in later material. 
fallacies are weaved throughout these putrid paragraphs of revolting dishonesty. There is at least one lie or fallacy in virtually every sentence, and I've marked them in the image below. Lying. The first two sentences of this passage are an example of simple lying. A seemingly ubiquitous technique of Christian apologetics is to proclaim that atheists have faith in evolution or science, just as Christians do in God. However, this is untrue. The same technique is employed to accuse evolution of being a religion, and atheists of having a religion. Ad hominem. Refuting an argument by attacking the opposition's personal character or reputation. The authors are trying to make atheists seem untrustworthy by stating that atheists simply choose not to believe. That is, they are inherently untruthful and liars. Lying combo. This is a lie by omission. The authors are generalizing and implying that all Christians have good reasons based on observation for what they believe. The truth is, most Christians do not have good reasons for what they believe. Many people are Christian simply because their parents were. Even professional apologists have failed to make strongly persuasive arguments, despite trying for 2,000 years. Straw Man Making an easily refuted caricature of an argument, and attacking that instead of someone's actual position. Atheists do not have faith about the beginning of the universe, the topic at hand, as a position held via faith is a position held without evidence. Suppressed evidence! People do not choose their beliefs. They are either convinced, or they are not. If you disagree with this, choose to believe that you are a squid. Go on. Right now. If you can choose your beliefs, you should be able to alter your belief about what you are instantly and without evidence. Here, the authors are stating that they have both evidence and philosophical proof for their god. For some reason, however, they have not presented this. Instead, they are presenting a laundry list of logical fallacies. Meanwhile, many intellectuals more sophisticated than the two dotards who wrote this butt-wipe of a book continue to bring up very strong objections to the existence of this supposed designer. In fact, they bring up strong objections to the anthropic principle itself, which is a linchpin of this chapter's argument for intelligent design. Ad hominem combo. The authors are saying that atheists refuse to admit belief in any god, despite evidence, because they are dishonest. Guilt by association. Condemning someone's viewpoint because of what group they belong to. This implies all atheists willfully deny the Christian god because one atheist does so. However, whether or not the quoted scientist even does so is debatable. Quote mining. Presenting truthful information, but deliberately withholding parts of it. The quote presented here is taken out of context, or mind, to make it appear that the speaker, Dr. David Gross, only rejected the anthropic principle because of anti-Christian bias. In fact, the author's own source article pointed out that Gross had many other issues with the idea, in addition to it seeming too religious, i.e. untestable, for the field of physics. Overgeneralization Applying one or two examples to all cases. Even if this were, in fact, the full extent of Dr. Gross's objections to the anthropic principle, his attitude toward it does not represent all other critics of it. Ad hominem triple combo. This entire passage is an example of this fallacy. It is an extended attack on the character of atheists in general, and attempts to paint them all as untrustworthy. It says they're all deceitful hypocrites who either should believe in God deep down, but somehow choose not to, or they're simply liars who have no good basis for what they believe. In all, I counted 10 fallacies in 10 sentences. One of those sentences is the words, Atheists don't. And one of those sentences is the emphatic statement, That's why we don't have enough faith to be atheists. So, in a way, there are more fallacies here than there are sentences arguing for anything. 
Credit where it is due, I suppose. I imagine it takes skill to be this catastrophically dishonest and wrong. Special thanks once again to Emma for letting me speak to all of you. Visit my channel for more content like this, including a follow-up I've already posted about another knight of the dunce table, the legendarily reprehensible Maddie Powellette. Thank you so much for watching, I do hope you enjoyed this video, if you did, make sure to leave a like and a comment down below, and head over to Willow's channel for the other video on Matt Powell that is out right now, give her some love, give her a little subscribe, she really really deserves it, have a very lovely week, and I will see you really soon!